So I would like to share with you some of the things that have been keeping me busy uh, and sometimes sleepless at night. And that's sort of to understand how planets form, in particular understanding this new class of planets that have been discovered um, over the last few years um, that I call here close-in exoplanets. So I spent all my time basically trying to understand how planets form. And to me, this is the most interesting of all possible inverse problems that you could come up with, um, because we have this amazing um, idea, or very precise idea, of what we want to end up with, right? We know we want to be able to form our solar system. And since about two decades, we know we also need to explain the formation of hot Jupiters, you know, planets as big as Jupiter orbiting their stars on very short orbits. And we need to be able to explain all these multiple planet systems that have been discovered by the Kepler mission. So we have a really good idea of the outcome. We have great observations. And actually, we have pretty good observations about the very initial condition, um, which are disks around um, stars. These disks are mostly hydrogen helium with a little bit of dust. But we, would, we have very few constraints on how to get from A to B. Um, because we have very few observational constraints. So we have to span about 5 billion years in time from those initial conditions to today. Um, and we have to go over many, many orders of magnitude, literally from micro dust grains to planets as big as Earth and Jupiter. So how do you accomplish that? That's really what we're trying to learn. And so um, we have to be a little bit of creative of data points, what we what we want to use to test our planet formation theories. So we have various, various options, and I think we try to utilize all of them. So one, for example, is our own solar system, um, here shown with the Kuiper belts. So we have some imprints of planet formation that are still left over in our solar system today. So that's one example. So we know that whatever planet formation theory we come up with has to explain this. Then we can use um, geochemical and cosmochemical constraints, for example, of highly silified elements. Um, to learn about the late accretion stage of the terrestrial planets. Um, and then what uh, I use the most is actually physics, you know, taking the laws of physics and applying them and see where they lead you, what they tell you about planet formation. So today I want to focus, although I could spend an hour talking about both cosmic chemistry constraints and the Kuiper belt, today I want to focus on exoplanets. Specifically, these exoplanets that um, are often called super-Earths or mini-Neptunes or sub-Neptunes. So what are they? They are actually the most um, common planets we know of in our galaxy to date. There could, there could be even smaller ones that are more common, but these are the ones that have been discovered um, most ubiquitously. Um, I'm showing here, uh, on the plot here, um, to your left, um, basically a snapshot of all the planetary candidates from the Kepler mission. So you have on the x-axis period and days, and on the y-axis their size. And so you can see in size they're between roughly Earth and Neptune. Neptune is this red line up there, its radius. In size they're between Earth and Neptune. Um, in their orbital location, their distance from the star, most of them are within 100 days. So for comparison, our solar system is down here. This is Mercury, the little dot down here at 100 days, and then Venus and Earth. Uh, all in green. So what, what do we learn from this? What, what we learned already is um, that planets that are very different from our own solar system are extremely common. We already know that at least every other star in our galaxy has one of those super-Earths or mini-Neptunes in orbit around it. And we are, the solar system is one of those other 50%, not yet an outlier, but in the other bin for which we haven't discovered. We don't have one of those super Earth or mini Neptunes. So we don't yet truly know how rare we are. Um, at least if you define us in terms of having an Earth sized planet at 1 AU. Because the region down here that you see is empty in this, in this diagram, it's empty right now because we are not yet sensitive to discovering planets in this region routinely. So the jury is still out. It could truly be empty because they're not there. But for now, it's empty because we haven't been able to find planets. We're not able to find planets uh, uh, of this small size on those longer periods. But TESS is starting to change that. What else do we know? We actually, in some cases, we are lucky enough not only have discovered the planets and now their radius because they're transiting across the star, we actually occasionally also are fortunate enough to know their masses. And once you have both radius and mass, the obvious thing to do is to calculate a bulk density. 
And you may think this is a very, very little information and a very poor thing to do, and it is, but on the other hand, it actually already tells us that m many of these planets have densities that are so low that they need to be engulfed in some sort of hydrogen helium envelope, so they cannot all just be rocky cores. And if you actually um, plot a histogram of their relative occurrence versus size, you see this double peak distribution. So one population um, is roughly, say, 2.4 Earth radii, and the other population is significantly smaller, maybe 1.4. And the question is, so these are the most common planets that we know of today. The question is, should we think of them as two populations having been formed as two populations? You know, these are sort of maybe the terrestrial planets. These are maybe the analogs to Uranus and Neptune in their formation. Or is this really one population? Did they form in one way, one common way? And then through their evolution, um, they appear to us as two populations and we observe them today. And the, uh, I give you the answer right now and then I'll explain to you how we get there. I'll show to you that it really looks like they formed as one population, and then through their thermal evolution and time, um, they were sculpted in a way that the smaller ones lost their envelopes, um, and you get this double peak distribution. And I'll show that this is entirely a process from planet formation itself. It has nothing to do with actually the whole star, and for the experts in the audience, with the EUV or X-ray radiation that those planets receive. I'll argue this is entirely a byproduct of their formation, so a property of the planet itself rather than the star. Okay, so how do we get there? So basically, we realized, given this really interesting observations, what we really need to understand from first principles is sort of the physics of gas accretion and then thermal evolution of your planet. And that's what I would like to share with you. So imagine you have a gas disk, right? We know planets form in gas disks. We know those planets formed in gas disks because they accreted gas. We have, they have gas, hydrogen, helium around them today. So you imagine you have a planetary core and you put it down in a gas disk and you can ask a very simple question. What fraction of that gas is gravitationally bound to the planet so it has an atmosphere? Um, it's very simple homework. Everyone could do this. Um, and, the, and it is whatever material is basically inside um, the Bondi radius of that planet. So it's the radius um, up to which it can gravitationally hold on to that gas. If you calculate this as a tiny amount, it never gives you a few percent. So many of these planets have hydrogen helium envelopes that contain about a few percent of the total planet mass, so that's not, that's not the full answer. But that's the initial condition. What happens next is actually you wait a little bit, and the envelope you created, the gas will um, cool and contract. As it cools and contracts, now basically you created extra space in the outer regions uh, of the Bondi radius, and more gas can flow in. Um, and so you start accreting additional material. And in this sense, you can think of this accretion process as cooling. So how much of the gas you can accrete just is regulated by how quickly the envelope you already have can cool and contract so you can accrete additional material from the disk. So the amount you gas accrete uh, is set by the cooling. And you can actually write down and derive um, the typical envelope fractions you would expect. So F is the ratio of atmosphere, of gas, um, to the core, and by core I have to warn, because I know there's some like geologists or geophysicists in the audience, by core I just mean the mantle and the core, the, the solid part of the planet. I'm not, I'm not talking about the true iron core. Um, it depends how, how big the core is, right? Because the bigger the, the core, the larger the gravity, so the more material I can accrete, the larger is my Bondi radius. And then, because it just depends on how quickly I can cool, it depends on the opacity of the envelope, um, and the lifetime of the disk, because if I have more time, I can cool, cool for longer, so I can accrete material. What this does not depend on is actually how much um, mass you have in gas in the disk or the local disk surface density, um, because the envelope, the profile of your atmosphere that you develop um, is such that, that in the inner region, heat transport will be by convection, so you get something close to an adiabatic profile, and in the outer region, you develop a thin radiative region that's close to isothermal. I mean, the isothermal profile has an exponential um, decay in density, and that's what connects back to the disk density. And so the disk density only enters in this logarithmically as a result. So the first order, it's actually not sensitive to that. <laughs> 
Okay, so with this picture, you can actually, for typical few Earth mass, so cores that are a few times the mass of the Earth, uh, for typical separations, it's just the distance from the star, essentially, it's just the equilibrium temperature that tells you how hot you would be, which is equivalent to thinking of the distance from the star. Um, in the lifetime, I can tell you how much gas you accrete, and you get it's a few percent, two or five percent, depending on the exact details that you like. So we should say, great, right? We formed our planets. We, I mean, we got our envelopes. We can explain why you have a few percent mass and gas. However, that's not the true story. Actually, many papers have been written saying that that's it. You're done. Um, but I don't think it's correct because you can't just, you know, planet formation doesn't stop there. Well, the next thing that's going to happen is the gas dust will dissipate, right? We know gas dust go away on a few million year time scales. And as the dust, gas dust dissipates, you lose the pressure support from the disk. So imagine your planet in your envelope, but now you lose the pressure support on the outside of your atmosphere. And what your envelope wants to do, of course, gas wants to expand, right? It will account for the pressure support by expanding. And your planet has enough heat because it's really still contracting um, so that it can fuel this expansion. And basically, the outer layers uh, expand adiabatically, and the planet will lose the outer regions it has just accreted an atmosphere during this dispersal uh, time scale. So over a few million years, you lose 50 or 75% of all the gas you just accreted, just because essentially you lose the pressure support on the outside. And there's enough energy to fuel this loss. But fine, you can say, okay, I can live with this. We can you know, give up half of what we just got. Um, and again, you can calculate what the typical envelope fraction should be given a core mass and a distance from the star. But this then would be the true initial condition. So people often run thermal evolution models of planets. This would set the initial conditions. Because the planet loses these outer regions, as a result, the remaining envelope can actually contract rapidly. You got rid of energy by mass loss. So now the remaining envelope you have can contract um, and the planet shrinks on a few million in time scale to radii that is comparable to the core radius. So your planets actually become relatively small um, much more quickly than you would get if you would ignore uh, this dispersal phase. And now it gets really interesting because now the fate of your planet depends on where most of the heat is stored. So um, there are basically two regimes. The, the one that's been um, more commonly studied in the literature um, is the case where most of the heat or the heat capacity is in the envelope. Um, and this is the case if your envelope contains more than roughly 5% of the total mass of your planet. If this is the case, then after the distance brittle phase, um, your planet will just continue to shrink and contract over time, and this actually takes giga years. Right? Even Jupiter today is still losing heat. It's still slowly cooling and contracting, um, even today, after uh, 4.5 billion years. And so what, if you look at the structure of the envelope, you again, you just have this inner adiabatic region, you have this outer isothermal region, they're connected at the rate of convective boundary, and over time, this will just shrink and contract, and your planet will cool. So this part is all good. So those planets get to keep um, the envelopes that are left after the dispersal phase. This is not true for planets that have less than roughly 5% of the total mass um, in gas. Because for those, if you look at the energy budget that's available for cooling, you actually find that there's a large reservoir in the core. And in fact, um, it's so large that it can, can, it can fuel a continuous mass loss. So what happens is those planets too, right? They want to cool and contract. They're cooling all the time. However, as the envelope the, is giving away energy at the rate of convective boundary, writing it away, heat is being resupplied from the core. Um, because the cores are still very hot. So just to give you an idea, they're between 10 to the 4 to 20 to the 5 Kelvin. So there's all completely molten, very well coupled to the atmosphere. And so, so as the envelope wants to cool and get rid of its heat, the core is just resupplying it because, of course, the core wants to cool too. The system has to cool together. And so as this is happening, instead of the envelope then shrinking because it lost energy and can contract, because the energy is being resupplied from the core, it stays inflated. And because it can't shrink, the mass loss can continue in time. 
the way you escape the mass loss is because you can shrink. So that will increase the mass loss time scale exponentially, and so you're safe. But because we cannot shrink in the scenario, um, the mass loss will just continue, and it can continue over giga year time scales. And actually, many of these planets energetically will shed their entire envelope. They'll be stripped completely um, to their barren core. And the only thing that can really save them, or a, a fraction of the atmosphere, would be time. Because the mass loss can take a significant amount of time. Um, you, it, and it can take giga years, especially if you're further away from the star, you can keep you can keep some of those atmospheres just because you haven't yet waited long enough. Not because it will never happen, it's an ongoing process, but you're still doing it right now. Okay, so what did I tell you? So I told you that if these planets formed in one sort of paradigm, in one scenario together, that you actually expect sort of a bimodal final outcome. And there should be planets that lost their entire envelopes, and there should be population of planets that basically kept a few percent of their total mass and gas. And the only thing that sort of divides between those two outcomes is basically the fraction of the mass that's in the envelope in hydrogen helium compared to the core. And it's really just the heat capacity of the system, if you want to think about it in, in, physical, in physics. And where do those 5% come from? It just becomes, if you write down the heat capacity of an ideal gas, if you just want to get a feel for it, Right? If you take the ratio between the envelope and the core, it basically is just the ratio of the mean molecular weights. And that's roughly, that would give you this 5% number if you assume sort of Earth-like um, mantle and core compositions and a hygiene helium envelope. Okay, so now we can ask, how does this compare with the observations? So to do that, so I, I told you we have this large planet population, but for most planets, we actually only know their radii. Why do we only know their radii? It's because they discovered by the transit method that measures the, right, the planet is moving in front of the star, blocking out some of the light. But it's, a, it's because of the nature of the measurement, you only get to measure the ratio of the planet size to the star size. You don't know anything about its mass. We do have um, the measurement of masses for a subset of those planets, roughly 100 or so. Um, and uh, so we don't individually have all the information about every single planet in our system, but statistically, we can model them, um, I think, very well. So what we do is we use the observed distribution of planet masses for those um, planets that are smaller than uh, four Earth radii. And then we know from physics, it tells us, right, if this is correct, we know, because we know their distance from the star, we know how much envelope fractions they should have accreted, given their mass. Um, and we know how they should evolve in time during disk dispersal. And then we know which of those should lose their envelopes and which ones should retain them when you evolve them over the age of these systems, which is typically a few giga years. And if you do this, you indeed find this bimodal distribution. So the figure here on the right shows the relative occurrence, that's just like how frequent these planets are, is a function of radii. And then the gray histogram with the arrow bars is from the observations. And the red are the results from this very simple model that I described to you. And you really do get um, this double peaked uh, distribution. And so this is really entirely just as a byproduct of planet formation. The standard explanation of the literature that's usually invoked to explain this is photo evaporation. What is photo evaporation? Photo evaporation um, is when you strip the envelope of a planet because of um, high UV or X-ray radiation from the star. And this can lead to mass loss. Um, and, it's also, and I also think it's important for some of the systems. Um, but you actually do not need it to produce this bimodal distribution in the exoplanet population. Um, and I also think if that would be the dominant process, it wouldn't give you such a clean um, gap. And the reason for that is if you look actually at the data, that even if you just focus on sun-like star, stars, you get more than two of the magnitude variations in the EUV and X-ray intensities of young stars. So, it's, so when it's there, it will work very well. But if you statistically account for the large variation there is and fold this into your model, um, the, this valley that we see in the data wouldn't be as clean. <coughs> 
But coming back to the core powered mass loss, that's how we call this mechanism, we can do more detailed comparisons. So the next thing to ask, so I only showed you the histogram, but we can also make predictions on how this should vary uh, with period or with distance from the star. So what I'm showing you here is, again, a relative occurrence rate. So the darker red is like more frequent, the yellow is like less common. And now this histogram is shown, is spread out in period space. So you have period, orbital period, um, of those planets on the x-axis. And you can see clearly this valley and these two peaks. Um, and you can see that it has a dependence on distance from the star. And for comparison, you can see here, this is taken from observations. And you, you can see that uh, it actually you know, sort of predicts the location and also the the slope um, pretty well. So what is nice is in this very simple model, we can analytically derive what the slope of the valley should be. And what this is driven by is basically where the mass loss time scale becomes equal to the cooling time scale of my planet. Because I told you, as soon as I can cool and contract, I can escape the mass loss because I managed to shrink my envelope enough. If I can shrink my envelope faster, then I'm losing mass, I'm safe. So just from this very simple condition, setting those two time scales equal, I get this relationship here that between the mass of the planet, the radius of the planet, and the period. And they basically have to be constant. So now, all I need to derive a slope in this space is I have to assume something for the mass-radius relationship between the planetary core. Um, and so, actually, Sarah Seeger showed many years ago that this mass radius relationship for the core is close to, <laughs> as closely scaled to the mass of the planet to the radius to the fourth power because of self-compression, right? If you would assume you had an incompressible material, um, you would, of course, expect a third power, but because when you get to larger lab planets, self-compression becomes more and more important when you get roughly to the fourth power. And indeed, we can actually measure this now from the data, and we find that the slope, you can now play this two ways, you can Take this and match the observations, in which case you need uh, roughly a fourth power to match it, or you can substitute this relationship to the fourth power and you'll get a slope um, of minus 0.11 in, in this log space units, um, which is actually in very good um, agreement, um, especially with astroseismology measurements that were able to measure the slope more precisely than shown in this figure here, because they could do this for a smaller set of planets um, but just um, to a higher precision. So what we already learned is um, that we can really probe um, the importance of the self-compression in these super-Earth cores. What else? We also actually know we can probe this way something about the core composition of these planets. Um, Again, simply from this relationship before, because both the mass and the radius enter, and we have to exchange those two somehow to only have one dependent variable, we actually learn something about the average density of your planets, the average density of the core. So um, if you would have a, um, cores that are similar to the Earth in terms of iron and, and silicate, um, you actually match the location of the valley very well. But you could come up with more extreme examples the most extreme ones that we thought were plausible were like planets that were made entirely out of iron, so no mantle, so like extreme version of Mercury, if you wish. Um, not that I'm really advocating there should be a whole plant population just like it out there, but if you do that, this valley, the whole distribution moves um, up, basically to larger planet sizes. Um, and you can see that that's not consistent with the observations. Vice versa, you can make them entirely out of water and ice, in which case the whole distribution moves down to smaller planet sizes, basically because the material is less strongly bound, so more planets will be able to lose their envelopes. Um, and again, you can show that's inconsistent with the observation. So we can conclude from this, although we don't know much, we don't actually know, we know very little about most of these planets, that as a population, as a whole, most of them um, are consistent with, with basically densities very similar to our terrestrial planets. And then you can try to be even more ambitious and you can see, well, how much water can I stick into them, assuming sort of a terrestrial composition, 
um, and still match the observations, and we find about 20%. So they're not true, like, I see your water worlds, you could, but 20% is quite a lot of water, don't get me wrong, right? The Earth has a tiny amount of water. Uh, we have about 10 to the minus four or so of our total um, mass budget on water. So this is still very water rich compared to the Earth, but they're not just ice balls. The other thing you can um, study from this is actually the underlying mass distribution. Right? We had to assume something for the planet masses, how they distribute it. Um, how the small ones are kind of distributed with respect to larger ones, and we took some observations, but you can play around with this and now say, well, how, if I would change this, how much can I change this and start violating um, the observational constraints? And the main thing that changing the planet mass distribution will do, if you like start favoring bigger planets versus smaller planets, is it changes actually not the location of the valley, it just changes the intensity or the amplitude of these two peaks above and below. And so we can use this um, to start to infer additional information about the underlying mass distribution um, of those exoplanets. And then most interestingly is we can start um, comparing and making predictions on how this depends on the properties of the host star. So one, one example is how this depends on the mass or the luminosity um, of the stars on which they are around. So because in the poor core powered massless mechanism, it's only the bolometric luminosity that drives the mass loss or that helps with the mass loss. Why? Because where does, why does the bolometric luminosity of the star enter at all? It, it enters because it sets the outer boundary condition of your problem, right? If you think about it as a hydrodynamics problem, or about fluid dynamics, um, it sets the outer boundary condition of your problem because it sets the temperature um, when you basically, where you escape, where you no longer have an atmosphere. But you don't care at all about the X-ray or EUV radiation. Whereas if you would be stripping those planets using this um, radiation, then all the trends you get should depend on the stronger the X-ray and EUV radiation is, the better you should be at stripping those cores. And it turns out that that's they're actually strongest for lower mass planets. So if it's really, if planets really lose the envelopes because the EUV and X-ray is stripping the envelopes, we would predict that lower mass stars, which are more active in the XUV, should be able to strip even larger planets. So you would expect this valley at larger planet radii um, than if you go to larger stellar masses. So you would actually expect a negative slope in this plot. But the observ this is from observations from Fulton Pettigrew, and they are find, they actually find a positive slope. If you lose the envelopes using this core powered mass loss mechanism, then you do expect a positive slope. Why? Um, because I told you the larger mass stars just have a higher bolometric luminosity, and therefore more massive stars are able to strip the envelopes of more massive planets, and that's why this valley, where, the, where you have the gap between the two peaks, moves to larger sizes. So we would say that this is just a natural consequence, a prediction of the way these planets lost their envelopes and are shaped. Whereas um, there are now several papers coming out finding this observationally, and because they cannot explain this by photoevaporation alone, they then invoke that the underlying planet population has to be different so you can switch the trend that they would naively predict. So there's two very different interpretations, right? So we, would, we have the same planet population around one solar mass star compared to a 0.9 or 0.8, and we would predict this trend um, naturally if you wish the byproduct of this mass loss mechanism, whereas here the interpretation would have to be that you have to change the, the planet masses that you form around a star that's 0.9 solar masses compared to one solar mass to explain this if you only allow for photoevaporation to operate. Okay, so you can say, fine. How, how about other constraints? We can do even slightly better than what I told you. Um, because for a subset, um, we, not, we actually do have the masses of these planets. So for a subset of, of my sample, so the, the, the distributions I showed you so far is all of the Kepler planets, so it's like several thousands of them. 
and we modeled a population of more than a million to have a true statistical representation of comparing our model with the observations. But for about 100 of them, we also have masses of good determined masses, and you can then ask or estimate what is their fraction in hydrogen helium. So we can do a slightly more detailed comparison. Um, and that's um, what I'm doing here. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you temperature. This is um, basically equivalent to saying distance from the star. So this is sort of the equilibrium temperature that a planet would have, just given um, the stellar radiation it receives. And then on the y-axis, it's, it's planet mass. And so what I told you basically is that planets um, which have these uh, which only have a few percent of the total mass in the envelope or less, they should be stripped. So they should live in this region down here. So this line that I drew here called Bondi, the ones that will fall below the line should have no atmosphere because they are the ones for which you can lose the envelopes. Um, or we would predict you should lose those envelopes. The ones that live above the line are the ones that can retain uh, or should be able to retain hydrogen helium envelopes. And now we can actually put the observations on this. And that's what we find. So all these points correspond to planets that have measured masses and radii. And then we color coded them here according to the amount of gas we can infer given the errors. And so the important part is that the black points are all the ones that correspond to planets that are consistent with having no envelope at all. We can't detect, given their radius, we can't really detect any hydrogen helium. And so it really looks like that nature did strip or put all the planets that have no envelopes um, in this region where indeed you would predict they should have lost them um, after formation. Furthermore, the fact that we, we don't really see um, black points in the upper region, maybe with one exception, suggests, um, at least to me, that these planets really seem to have formed as one population because the ones that look like barren cores or that look like terrestrial planets now all live in this parameter space where they could have had these large envelopes and lost them. Right? If you will find planets in this other parameter space up here and they would look like barren cores, I would not have an easy way to tell you how they could have lost a hydrogen helium envelope. Um, so then we would have to, then I would conclude at least, that they maybe really have formed as true terrestrial planet analogs. Um, because if they had formed with a hydrogen helium envelope, um, they still should have them today. But this is not the case. So this suggests that we can really, at least for now, think of the exoplanet population of these closed end planets um, having formed um, sort of as one population. And the fact that we see them um, in these two different ways, of these two peaks in their sizes, really is a consequence of the planet formation process um, after they form, because some of them lost their hydrogen helium envelopes, and not that a fraction of them accreted hydrogen helium envelopes, another fraction didn't. The, the other thing that um, you can learn from this is that there is actually more spread uh, in this data, and the errors are still big, so you have to be a little bit careful with the interpretation of this. Um, but basically, I told you there is a fairly straightforward relationship between how much envelope you should accrete um, given your planet mass. And you can then in detail compare this with the observation. So that would actually lead to lines parallel to this blue line that I've drawn here for envelope fractions between 5 and 10%. And if you compare this with the blue points, the agreement is OK. But the important part is that there are many planets that live above this line that have envelope fractions below the 10% that they should have been able to accrete. So what this means is that, um, or one interpretation of this is that there is more going on for these planets than just the accretion um, and this partial atmospheric loss um, itself because you have this nice scatter. So if, if the scatter is real and doesn't go away once we have much better mass measurements, then one idea for how you would explain this is to have late collisions in these systems. And I think, I don't know if Eric was going to talk about multiple planet systems, but basically Kepler um, discovered many planets um, in systems that basically you have more than one planet, brothers and sisters. Um, and in many cases there, 
you have um, similar planet masses, but extremely different sizes. So again, you would have a barren rocky core in a large hydrogen helium envelope. And in this case, it's often hard to explain um, why some of them um, look as different as, you, um, as we see them. And so collisions after the, after the gas has gone away um, that are expected from dynamical reasons to reach sort of long-term stability um, may be the culprit for that. So we will see whether this, mix, this, this scatter remains real um, you know, in a few years' time. Um, but there are other mechanisms that may um, leave some signatures in the data. And you know, TESS um, hopefully will give us many more um, data um, to compare with this. So I think with this, um, let me try to summarize. I know it was a lot of information. So uh, when we think of planets forming, especially the part of the envelope accretion, it's not sufficient to just um, let the planet sit in the gas disk and um, wait for it to accrete its envelope. Um, it, often, it loses typically 50% of what it has accreted during the gas stage during the disk dispersal phase, simply because we remove the pressure support on the disk, so the gas will adiabatic expand if you wish into vacuum, and there's still enough energy in the interior of the planet that it can refuel supply of gas, and you really sort of drive a Parker-type wind, losing those outer layers. Then, so within a few million years, so after disk dispersal, those planets will shed 50% of their mass, they will shrink to sizes that's just a few times their core radius, so they become relatively small rather quickly. You wouldn't have that um, otherwise. Otherwise, you would slowly cool and contract. And I think this gives you the true initial condition, or our best guess, if you wish, for if you just want to run thermal evolution models for planets. From then on, there are two different pathways that your planet will follow, and that just depends on where most of the heat capacity of your system is, most of the energy available for cooling. If it's in the envelope, you're all good. If the core doesn't contribute significantly to the overall energy budget. In this case, your envelope will shrink and contract in time, and you're all good. Um, you keep those gaseous envelopes, and we think this is probably the population in the second peak that we see in the planet distribution, so these sub-Neptunes, if you wish, planets that have a few percent of their total mass and gas. And if you only have less than a percent or a few percent of their total mass and hydrogen helium to start off with, you'll tend to drive the mass loss because your core has so much energy, so much, so much heat stored in it, as it cools, it can basically lift the remaining envelope with it, drive a mass loss over giga year time scales, and you can really erode the entire atmosphere you had. So if you think this is, gives you the peak for the small planets, the Earth, the rocky type ones that look rocky today. And so you naturally get, just as a byproduct of planet formation, this primordial um, distribution that we see in the exoplanet data. So just this core cooling alone can give you this valley we see. It doesn't mean that food evaporation and other processes never happen. Um, but I, th I think this is probably the, the main reason f um, for why we have this valley and why it's so clean. Um, we can see it so nicely in the data. Um, so the majority, I think with one exception, when I checked last time, are consistent with truly being stripped cores because they live in a, in a parameter space where they would have, could have, where they could have had hydrogen helium envelopes which are lost in time. So I think the true evidence for terrestrial planets that formed as true Earth analogs is still very rare in the exoplanet population as of right now. I'm sure they're there, um, but most likely at larger semi-major axes. Um, and then the last point is there is, there appears to be a more compositional diversity than predicted just by gas accretion alone and I, we'll see whether this will bear out in the data as we get more precise mesh measurements, but that may suggest um, for later sort of dynamical processes in these exoplanet systems.